Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. Today, we are in the series In Control, which is empowering patients to take control of their heart failure. This is the third in the sessions, and this one, we are going to be taking a deep dive into heart failure monitoring. Just a couple of quick housekeeping notes before we get started. All attendees are in listen-only mode. So if you can't hear, hopefully you can see the slides and read it. Check your audio button on your personal computer to make sure that the sound is on. That's typically the problem and that will help you along. Um, please type any of your questions into the Q&A section. Um, and you can do this at any time during the presentation. Um, and then I will read the questions at the end um, to Dr. Sauer and he will be able to answer them for us live. Um, and as always, a PDF version of the slides, as well as a recording of this presentation, will be available on the Mended Hearts website following the event. Just a quick note, as you probably know, Mended Hearts' mission is to inspire hope and improve the quality of life for heart patients and their families through ongoing peer-to-peer -peer support, education, and advocacy. We're very proud to let you know that you can now reach us in a a lot of different ways, um, not only at our regular websites, but we also have the myheartvisit.org website and our new Heartline, where you can call and get a peer support visit Monday through Saturday from 10 a.m. till 6 p.m. You can also find us on all the social media channels. So without further ado, I am going to introduce our guest speaker today. I am Andrea Baer, your executive director, and I will be moderating today. It's a privilege to be able to introduce to you Dr. Andrew Sauer. From he is the Chief Professor, Associate Professor, Chief Division of Advanced Heart Failure Therapies and Cardiac Transplantation Department of Cardiovascular Medicine. So, Dr. Sauer, I'm going to turn it over to you, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for so much for that kind introduction, and I'm uh, considered a great privilege anytime I have the opportunity to speak with patients and their family members, uh, particularly those invested in understanding more about the heart failure space and heart, the heart failure disease, and to be able to talk a little bit about you know what we're trying to do in that space. Um, I'm sure I do not have to tell you all, the audience, that heart failure is a pretty terrible disease. Um, I think that we're trying to get the public to understand that there needs to be a greater urgency around uh, diagnosing and treating heart failure. Um, I, I frequently bring up the analogy that if we would treat heart failure and talk about heart failure um, like cancer is discussed, I think people would approach the therapeutic um, uh, opportunities much differently. Just this week, I had a patient in clinic who unfortunately had her copay of one of her really important medicines that has helped her heart improve, uh, go from $40 to $120. And this is a tragic part of our system is that we haven't figured out how to better um, provide care and access for patients uh, in a way that's economically supported by our healthcare system. But even with, with that, you know, if this was cancer, uh, you'd never be deba debating about how to pay for a chemotherapy drug. And so I'm trying everywhere I go to impress upon people that our job is to treat heart failure like we would cancer and treat it urgently and treat it with the best therapies that we have and really try to put it in remission because it's not a curable disease um, in, in most situations. Um, it is a chronic disease and it afflicts, uh, it afflicts people in a significant way causing great, um, great morbidity and mortality and disability. So today, what I have the privilege of discussing is how we use remote monitoring technologies. So our, our outline here, and I, I'm a big fan of telling people what we're gonna tell them, uh, tell them and then tell them what we told them. So there's a little bit of planned redundancy in this just to make sure that the take home points are clear for everybody. So our strategy for doing shared care, which is shared care with the patient, care, shared care with the community that the patient's in, including the local physicians caring for the patient, um, and the nurses as well that are on the front line. Our strategy is first to make sure we know what our mission is and we'll talk about that, how that fits our program. Uh, outlining best therapies. So we have a definition of best therapies for heart failure endorsed by the American Heart Association and other societies. Um, what are they and do we know what those are and how do we apply them? 
Next is begin with home. So you can't expect other people to clean up their house if you don't clean up your own house. So we'll talk a little bit about our story and how we did that here at the University of Kansas Health System. And then um, five is getting out a map and trying to figure out how to extend our reach to patients who otherwise have a difficulty uh, reaching us. So here we are in, in Kansas where there's a great uh, rural geographic disparity for, for care and care access. And so our telemedicine and remote monitoring programs have allowed us really to bridge that gap. Um, six is add the technology. So we have to have a way to pay for technology. So you really do need a business strategy. And so I, I wanna also talk to patients and family members that there is a pragmatic limitation to all of the technology we bring, which is it has to be paid for by somebody somehow. So we try very hard to use creative resources to generate the, the revenue streams necessary to pay for technology. And then one of the ways we test how we're doing is we pilot things and we're always piloting new technologies to try to stay cutting edge and innovative uh, while also figuring out the pragmatic challenges of bringing technologies to the patient. And of course, the last step is reflect, revise and repeat. Um, so we can go to the next slide, please. So briefly, um, my story and, and, and my partner's story and um, our story really began about 2015 uh, at the time. Uh, Dr. Ava Kiri, who you see partnering with me, he's a surgeon. Um, he and I were on faculty at Northwestern Memorial Hospital in Chicago. Obviously a, a, a very exceptional place, um, a top 10 cardiovascular program. And we were doing just fine, doing our thing in advanced heart flare and participating in a heart transplant program there. And uh, we got a call from our, our, our now friends here in Kansas that you know, we should take a look at maybe building a program here in this region of the country. At the time, uh, there really was no dedicated advanced heart failure VAD, uh, the LVADs or the mechanical hearts or heart transplant program for the state of Kansas that served Kansas as a mission. And so we came and took a look at it and realized that there was a huge opportunity to serve patients that really had not been fully served or well served um, because of the challenges with the state line uh, boundaries. Next slide, please. So going back to starting with why, I'm a big fan of Simon Sinek. If you've ever seen his TED talk on start with why and sort of what, what really drives behavior and it's the limbic system. I mean, people are not motivated by how you do things or what you do as much as they're motivated and inspired by why you do things. And so when you get up every day and you can say, this is the reason why we're here, this is the purpose for our function as our team, then form can be allowed to follow function and you can build a, a whole enterprise of activities, whatever that be, be uh, to really support your why and your mission. And so for us, it was really a very serious, very simple mission, but we realized that there was a disparity in Kansas in terms of access to advanced heart failure therapies. And so our mission was to see that every patient in Kansas and the Kansas metropolitan region uh, in Kansas City have access to the very best therapies uh, available anywhere in the world. In other words, I just gave a presentation like this to my friends at Mass General Hospital last week. And I said, you know, if a patient can get the therapy at Mass General in Boston, they should be able to get it in Hayes, Kansas. And so this is very important to us. And so we really consider it uh, paramount for us to provide the best therapies to our patients. And so that's really what drives our mission. And our vision is really to be national leaders. I mean, and, and we've found ways to do all kinds of activities at a national uh, leadership level. And that's really a part of our identity at this point. So this is a, just a brief slide and it's not to get too caught up into the nuts and bolts or the, the, the physician language, but the bottom line is we know that if we apply the best therapies listed here in the column to the left, you know, medications like lisinopril ACE inhibitors, medications like Entresto, which you see on TV, medications like Carvedilol beta blockers, these are some of the best therapies we have to help with heart failure when the ejection fraction, the squeezing function of the heart is reduced. We know these medicines work. We know that they save lives. And we know that if we applied these, pa these to patients that we had today, that we could save literally millions more lives. And the reason why we're not saving a lot of lives is we still fail in, a, in an embarrassing way as a community in heart failure. We fail to get these therapies to the right patients at the right time at the right doses. In fact, a recent registry uh, called the CHAMP Heart Flare Registry demonstrated that only 1% of patients with heart flare with impaired heart function, reduced ejection fraction, have access to the right doses of the right medicines uh, at the right time. And what we've realized is that our system is really broken in being able to do this. And so what we're trying to do here in Kansas and other centers like us are doing 
is how do we figure out ways to do a better job with implementation of existing therapies? We call this implementation science, and we're thinking technology and protocols and leveraging pharmacists and nurses and other stakeholders, including patients and their family members, is really going to be the future for how we get this uh, problem to be solved. Next slide, please. You know, for patients who have normal ejection heart failure, this is actually half of the heart failure burden out there. These are patients who on echocardiogram, as you've probably heard, you know, the ejection fraction, which is normally around 60, 65%, is the amount of blood that's squeezed out of the heart in every beat. Normally your heart squeezes out about 60, 65%. And some of the heart failure out there is due to a drop in that ejection fraction, oftentimes as low as 15 or 20%. That tends to make sense to people. The heart muscle is weak, that's heart failure. But actually half of the patients out there that burden uh, our economic system and, and ultimately come to the hospital and need all these uh, care in the hospital have normal or preserved ejection fraction. This type of heart failure tends to be more due to heart muscle stiffness and some other complicated factors. And as you can see, the scientific community has really failed to come up with a great strategy. And so the red lines are this HEFPEF or preserved ejection fraction. And all of those trials in red are trials that did not show statistically significant benefit for whatever drug they were being tested. So it gets kind of depressing when you look at this side of the coin. And what we do know though, is that patients with that particular type of disease do very well with controlling risk factors like fluid levels, blood pressure, dietary, indiscretion and you know heart rhythm issues and so technology may help us do that better so let's talk a little bit about remote monitoring the number one device that has come out of the evidence that you may have heard of is a device um, called the cardiomems or remote pa pressure monitoring device and this was first shown uh, to be effective for patients in a study that was published in the lancet which is the universe uh sorry the uk's um basically Britain's main um, landmark journal. It's like our version of the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, their major journal published this in 2011. And these were patients who had been hospitalized for heart failure, who had what's called NYHA class three symptoms, meaning they had a hard time going up and down a single flight of stairs without catching their breath. Um, so very symptomatic. And these patients were pretty sick and they could have any number of ejection fraction. Um, so they had to also be on good, good medical therapies. This is a picture of the actual device. And if you can see my mouse, I'm not sure you can. I'm trying to draw a circle around the, the dime here. There we go. So that's the actual device. And the dime gives you a sense of scale. There's no battery involved. It is a tiny little device. I oftentimes refer to it as like a, a fly on the end of a, of, a, of a fly rod if you're into fly fishing. I like to do a little bit of fly fishing on my time off. And so it kind of looks like a little fly that you'd have at the end of a fly rod. Um, and once it goes into the patient with a simple minimally invasive procedure, um, that device works basically forever. It's not reliant on any batteries. And the patient lies on this pillow, as you can see in the middle of the screen. And the patient doesn't have to sleep on the pillow. The patient ultimately just gets on this pillow, just like they get on a scale. And then that, that little device communicates with the pillow and the signal goes up to the cloud, which is accessible to us through a computer. And we can actually see the patient's fluid levels as they're growing or reducing inside their body before they ever develop symptoms. That's the beauty of this technology. I frequently refer to this as having a weatherman forecasting heart failure. It's just like you can go outside and see if it's raining or not today. That's great, but wouldn't you like to know if it's gonna rain two days from now? This technology is designed to forecast heart failure events so that we can anticipate them, react to them, preempt them with therapies and avoid uh, detrimental events like heart failure hospitalizations. And what the paper showed was that the heart failure hospitalization burden continued to separate over time. So basically the red line here on the left is basically patients who had the, the device technology available to them. And the blue line were patients that did not have the device monitoring technology. And you can see that over time, these curves continue to se separate so that the number of hospitalizations accumulated much more in the patients who did not have the technology. So this allowed for basically the punchline here is a 37% reduction in overall hospitalizations. And also what we call the number needed to treat was basically for every four patients who underwent this technology, one hospitalization was, re was reduced. And when you consider that of all the dollars spent on heart failure, 
the vast majority of the dollars spent on this disease are spent on the cost required for caring for patients in the hospital, which also means those patients that come in the hospital have an increased risk of dying or having progressive deterioration of their disease. So hospitalizations are one of the most important things that we should be trying to reduce for patients, not only because it's a threat to their life, but because it's a significant impairment of quality of life to be spending your time in the hospital when you could be getting care at home. So the other thing that was really cool about this study is I mentioned already that the patients with normal or preserved ejection fraction have really no great therapies today. But what we saw, and this is back in 2011, and we've seen this signal repeated in subsequent studies, is that for that population, and that's the bar graph over here on the right, the preserved ejection fraction, we saw that the treatment benefit was even greater proportionally. When you looked at patients in the red bar, they did really well, even with the preserved ejection fraction compared to the patients in these gray bar uh, that were not getting access to the technology. And so again, when we say there are no great drug therapies for patients with preserved ejection fraction heart failure, I said that may be true, but with technology, we can be smarter at how we manage that patient's disease and using CardiMEMS or similar remote monitoring technologies, we've actually become much better at managing that patient's disease. <clears throat> So going back to our story, so one of the things we did five years ago is we literally locked our team into a room for two days. And what you see here on the top left is a picture of the stakeholders that got in that room. And I can't point them out individually, but obviously I'm in this picture as a physician, cardiologist, medical director of the heart failure program. But what you also see here is there are residents, interns, patient representatives, case managers, social workers, nursing managers, nursing executives, and internal medicine physicians, family medicine physicians, all coming together in the same room. And what you see us doing there as we've put sticky notes up on the wall, and if you look at this yellow piece of paper, is what we're doing is we're saying, how do we standardize when a patient comes to the hospital with an acute event, a decompensation, an acute illness? How do we standardize what happens to that patient and apply the best therapies endorsed by the American Heart Association and other societies like the Heart Failure Society of America, apply the best therapies, implement the best therapies at the right time for each patient in an organized way. I'm a big fan of a book by Atul Gawande called The Check Checklist Manifesto, which he describes, and of course, Atul Gawande is now is, is a pretty famous surgeon, um, and he's written several really important books, but in the book Checklist Manifesto, he points out that the way we don't sew sponges in patients in the operating room, and the reason why planes don't crash most of the time, and the reasons why skyscrapers don't fall down is because of checklists. And so why wouldn't we apply a similar innovation of implementing checklists wherever we can to make sure that patients get a standardized scientific approach to their care that can be replicated and duplicated and reduced variations of care, which expose patients to harm. So this is something we take very seriously and we try to do every time we can. So if we know something is a best practice, we try to implement it. And so this has led to guidelines, as you can see. And so this, this is an example of one of our guidelines. This is our pathway through the ER guideline. How do we decide which patient who comes to the ER goes to which floor, which nursing support unit, which physician service? And then the guideline to the right that you see on the far end of the screen is sort of implementing the guidelines that we have from the American Heart Association. And how do we make sure that the best therapies are applied in a systematic way, eliminating the need for every decision to be made by one person, which allows that fail-safe mechanism to be overcome. So in order to really grow anything, whether you're building a team in, you know, building a rocket or you're building a program in heart failure, it really helps if you get lots of champions and stakeholders. So I could give you lots of examples. For example, we have patient family stakeholders. We have patient advocates patients who've gone through our program, who've had a really good experience, or patients who've had a not so good experience, who will serve with us to say, how do we make our program better? And so this is just a couple of shots of some of our um, nurses who are really important stakeholders because they're part of the team. And we frequently talk about how heart failure is a disease that requires a team sport. So if you have heart failure today, or if you know someone who has heart failure today, who's really only having their disease managed by one physician, that's what I call the old world. The new world is team-based care. 
And there's not one patient that I see that doesn't also see many members of my team, my remote monitoring nurses, my clinic nurses, my heart flare nurses, my social workers, my pharmacists. Um, these, there's so many people on our team who participate in the patient's care. So it truly is a team sport. And by using many minds, we can do better job than any single mind, no matter how brilliant that single mind might be. So whenever you have um, events and momentum, success leads to more momentum, which allows you to have more success. And I love telling this part of our story. When I first came to Kansas City, we were told that we didn't need to be here because there was already a solid transplant program here in Kansas City. And that is true. Our friends and neighbors across the state line have an excellent heart transplant and heart failure program. But one of the things I said in response to that criticism that we didn't need to be here in Kansas was, you know what, at the end of the day, I think there's a lot more disease out there that's being left unattended. And so at the time that we came here in 2015, there were somewhere around 40 to 50 transplants happening in Kansas City every year, and somewhere around 10 to 20, maybe 30 of these mechanical hearts. And there was about 10,000 admissions every year to the hospital systems here for heart failure. And where we are today is Kansas City is about to see more than 70 heart transplants this year between our two programs. And we're going to see probably 70 mechanical hearts between our two programs, maybe more. And we're now seeing a significant increased access to the most sick patients of those 10,000 patients who come through our health systems. You know, the sickest of the sick are making it to the right places. And as you can see here, what we've been able to do over the last five years is really add additional points of access for all patients, in particular, our commitment to the state of Kansas, because this is our state where we physically reside. And nobody should be more invested in taking care of Kansans than the University of Kansas Health System, which is the academic medical center for our state. But the point of this slide is just to say that any team and any program can be mission oriented and take these, take these uh, tips about lessons learned and say, you know, if you want to build momentum, you got to have some wins. And when you have wins, you need to celebrate those wins and, and, and use it to propel more momentum. This picture is of uh, a patient. Just one last thing. This, this patient is, he gave me permission to use this. He's, he's been featured in many of our, um, of our public outreach brochures. His name is Jimmy. He is a professional, as you can see, a professional bass player in the local jazz scene here in Kansas City. And if you don't know much about the Kansas City jazz scene, jazz was partially born in cities like Kansas City and New Orleans and Chicago. And so there's a powerful back uh, scene. And Jimmy, if you don't, can't tell, has a mechanical heart sitting inside his body providing him um, life. And he's at cardiac rehab here getting some exercise. And, and we actually got to see him play at one of the local Kansas City um, barbecue joints where he was playing. And, and he eats less, he was eating a lot less barbecue at that point in time. But, um, you know, the patients can oftentimes be your greatest uh, champions for uh, what you're doing. And so we, we want to remind and remember the, 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 the benefit we received from, from Jimmy being a good advocate for us. So the next thing we did is look at, okay, we cleaned up our own house. We figured out how to standardize things. Now we're starting to look at technologies like CardiMEMS and remote monitoring to, to, to increase our reach. How do we tie the technology to the geographic kind of hub and spoke models? So on the top here is a heat map. And so that tells you sort of population for counties here in Kansas City Metro and, and in Kansas. And on the bottom, you see sort of the different hubs. And what we ultimately did is we set up multiple hubs within the Kansas City Metro but we also went out to the Hayes region, the Wichita region, and the Topeka region. And what we did is, I, the first thing I did is I sort of did reconnaissance for all of this. I got out on the road a lot in 2015 and 16, drove around, met with all these docs. And, you know, the feedback was very similar, which is we don't want you guys coming out here and trying to do what we know we can do pretty well. We'd like you to bring some technology and some access to advanced therapies, but we need to figure out a way to do this using shared care, you know, keeping the patient in their own community, we don't think you Kansas City guys should be taking all of our patients and trying to make them all go to Kansas City. And you can see with our geographic region, you know, you get out in the Garden City or Dodge City, some of these places that you read about in the old Western movies or the Dust Bowl. You know, these are real places in Kansas and they're very remote. And it's not reasonable to expect patients to have to drive seven hours to see us in order to get access to care. So if our mission is sincere to provide the best therapies to patients in Kansas, available anywhere, then the patient in Garden City should be just as important to me as the patient in Kansas City, Kansas, right down the street. So we set out on a mission to build these outposts 
and partner with local physicians and nurse practitioners and nurses using technology to provide some filling in of the gaps. So where we are today is we've gone from one clinic, which had about 1,500 to 2,000 patient encounters at the end of the first full year where we started our program. And as of today, we now have, this slide is already outdated. I should have brought the most updated slide, but we actually have 12 clinics and scattered over multiple sites in the Kansas City Metro and also multiple sites across the state of Kansas. And what those purposes of those sites are is we will, those, those will oftentimes be the intake opportunities for patients, new patients, patients who are still trying to figure out what their advanced heart flare therapies plan might be. And so, for example, I'll see a patient in Wichita, a local cardiologist will send them to me and they'll say, I think the patient needs a heart transplant. Oftentimes we find out actually they don't need a heart transplant. They just need maybe some advanced tweaking of their existing medicines or some available therapies that haven't been tried yet or maybe they need a remote monitoring device so that we can do a better job adjusting and anticipating events. Um, and so these are the kind of therapies we bring, but then we very routinely partner with the local community of care for that patient so that the patient doesn't have to spend all this time coming to Kansas City. And obviously with the pandemic, uh, telemedicine received an enormous boost by the government, basically legitimizing telemedicine visits as being just as uh, valuable to patient care as an in-person visit. So this took off all of the red tape and all of the handcuffs that we had in trying to provide access to patients in our own state by requiring them to come, come see us in Kansas City. Now we can see a patient using technology and a video conference anywhere in our state as long as they're within the scope of our license. So we've incorporated a number of technologies, and I didn't want to just focus on CardioMEMS, even though that's, the, that's sort of the workhorse of our technology. I think it's important for patients and families to know that there are a number of technologies now that are great partners with the existing telehealth programs that exist out there. So, you know, some programs have telehealth, and what they're talking about is they can do a video conference or a phone conference with you as a patient, and that allows you not to have to come into their clinic. But what we offer is more than just that. What we offer is technology that gives us device based uh, parameters for the patient, things beyond weight and blood pressure that help us be smarter in what we do to adjust medications and therapies. So this includes mobile app, wearables, implantables, and then telehealth. So for example, this is a homegrown mobile app uh, that we use, and this is really about empowering patients to be able to really take control of their own heart failure care. And so this is just one of many types of mobile apps that are out there. Um, but we are very progressive in engaging with patients, you know, even for patients who bring in their own Apple watch or their own platform that they like to use. What we try to do is say, okay, you have this technology, whether it's a mobile app, um, what we want to do is partner you with a nurse who is progressive and well-versed in engaging with you and your data so that we can actually adjust your medicines based on the data you present us and avoid a trip to the hospital or to our clinic. If we can do that, particularly since we can partner your technology or any mobile technology with existing technology using Zoom meetings and telehealth monitoring. And so again, because of the pandemic, the silver lining here is that we now have a lot more tools to keep you home and your family members don't have to drag you to our clinic five hours away if you're able to leverage some of the technology you have at your disposal. And um, you know, I was recently on a, on a panel with the American College of Cardiology, basically what's called a, a heart house. And on that heart house panel, we always include patient representatives as part of the discussion. But one of the questions that came up is, you know, with COVID and with heart failure in general, we've unfortunately seen disparities at times become expanded by the pandemic. So for example, Black Americans, um, uh, other demographics, uh, including rural uh, uh, poor Americans have been left in the, unfortunately left in the margins, left in the fringes as it relates to the pandemic and as it relates to heart failure. Um, so how do we bridge those gaps and reduce the disparities in access to care? And one of the folks on the panel said, you know, obviously telehealth seems like a great idea, but isn't going to just make the disparities worse. And I said, actually, what we found is that just about everybody has a smartphone with a camera on it. Even patients who are much older and, and we assume are not very good with technology, what we found is rather than assuming some 85-year-old patient isn't going to be good with technology, we find out that many of them are actually better than we think, maybe even better than us. And they also have family members that are pretty good with technology. So just about everybody can do a virtual visit with a camera on their phone or with an iPad or with a laptop with a camera. And since these cameras are everywhere now, 
is so much opportunity to use that to basically get patients engaged with their electronic medical record with something we call my chart. Uh, that's what we use here. And then that allows them to directly engage with the patient's physician, their notes, their documentation, be able to see the results of their imaging tests like their echo, see the results of their labs, and also engage with the nurse practitioners and physicians and the nurses using a video conference technology that just about anybody can do. So in my mind, telemedicine has increased access as opposed to increasing disparities. And I made that case very strongly to the American College of Cardiology, and I hope that they continue to act in incentivizing our government having our government incentivize behaviors that reduce the need for patients to trans have transportation to the clinic, requiring us to build buildings and clinics all over the place, and that will improve access to care. I'm almost done, uh, so we'll be have time for questions. So what's also really exciting is the wearable space. You know, there's a lot of technology. We have Garmin, for example, right here in Kansas City, and there's a lot of wearable technologies that's being developed. Uh, using cloud-based technologies. Obviously, you've all heard about the Apple Watch and what the Apple Watch can measure. There's also some direct monitoring technologies, uh, wearable space patches and monitors that might be able to do in a, in a non-invasive way the kind of things that we see with CardioMEMS implantable devices. By the way, this, sorry, go back. This picture is two of my nurses. Uh, Leslie is the gal and, and Chris is the guy. And uh, those two are full-time remote monitoring uh, nurse coordinators. They actually do nothing but monitor patients with our remote monitoring technologies that we've talked about. And that is a pretty awesome thing for patients. My patients feel like they're getting like a VIP card you know, because they have direct access to these nurses plus the regular nurses that already take care of our patients routinely in clinic. And as you can see, they spend a lot of time on the phone with the patients. They spend a lot of time looking at the patient's data. Um, and so all this data that we're talking about that we're looking at uh, is being monitored five days a week uh, by these, these expert heart failure nurses. Uh, over the weekends, we sort of, it's the old way of doing things. You kind of have to rely on the call service, but we have support for patients Monday through Friday uh, to really review their data and be able to make best decisions. And we make medication adjustments without seeing patients on a routine basis now using this technology. <clears throat> This is another technology we use. This is a remote monitoring wearable platform we use for our mechanical heart patients, so the LVADs. So these are the pumps that go into patients who are not great transplant candidates, but are ultimately dying of advanced heart failure. And one of the things we learned as our own program grew is we had a problem with patients having, having a stroke or, or death later after they had their surgery and we couldn't figure out what was going on. When we dug in, we realized that we weren't doing the best job we could in managing the patient's blood pressure or their um, blood thinners. And so we employ a technology called ActiCare, which basically allows the patient to get remote blood pressure monitoring, remote uh, point of care uh, measuring of the INR, which is a measure of blood thinning that we use uh, a medication called Warfarin uh, for patients with the mechanical hearts. And this allowed us to significantly improve um, reining in the INR level and the blood pressure levels for our patients. And guess what we found? Our stroke rate and our death rate, well beyond the surgery itself, went down significantly to the point where as of this most recent quarter, we saw that our one-year survival after a mechanical heart for our program is now 92%, which is actually better than the national survival rate for heart transplant today. And that is an enormous success, and it gives you the a sense of the kind of power that can come with a really effective remote monitoring program that allows us to do better job caring for patients. Even though the surgery has been a success, the post-operative care requires very careful monitoring and tight management of medications. This was a picture of us celebrating our 100th um, case of uh, remote monitoring, uh, PA pressure monitoring implant with the CardioMEMS device. Um, and uh, I, I guess we had a cake for that. And this is several key members of our team. You can recognize Chris and Leslie there again. Uh, and actually since then, uh, we're, 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 we're waiting to soon have another milestone of our 200th implant. Um, so that's actually a pretty sizable program. Um, if you look at um, programs across the country, there's probably only about 10 programs in the United States that have uh, seen more than 200 implants for this device. Um, there's also a pivotal trial that we have been helping to lead, uh, a trial called the Guide HF study. You can put a, you can Google um, guidelines or sorry, uh, clinicaltrials.gov if you want to learn more about it. But it's basically a, a additional exploration of this technology 
um, as part of the efforts to, to allow the FDA and the Centers for Medicare and the other commercial payers to really adopt this technology. Because right now, it's really only easily available to patients who have Medicare or some type of Medicare Advantage plan. There's very few commercial insurance co uh, uh, companies who are covering this because they're trying to suggest that this is not um, uh, that this is not mainstream therapy yet. They're trying to suggest that it's still investigational. We obviously believe that this is mainstream. It's already FDA approved. And we hope to see further adoption of paying for this technology for all commercial insurance payers, because we believe this is the future. Um, one other couple of slides on additional technology, and then I'll wrap up here. Um, there's a technology that we also employ here called HeartLogic, which, which takes advantage of existing device uh, implants. So, there's a type of device uh, called an implantable defibrillator or implantable pacemaker that can have these types of technologies. And, and one of the things we learned from this study is that with these types of technologies, we can actually predict heart failure events using existing devices that are there for other reasons. You know, a lot of patients with heart failure have implantable defibrillators. What if that de device technology can tell us about heart failure markers? So next slide. And so that device has, has special little, little gadgets inside it that can tell us a little bit about heart sounds and uh, fluid levels in the, in the heart and lungs, breathing rates, activity levels, heart rates. So similar to the Apple Watch, only much more sophisticated and robust data can be gleaned from these existing implantable devices that are going in for other reasons, by the way, going in to protect patients from heart rhythm problems or pacing needs. And so they go in already, why not find ways to get data back from those devices that can teach us about how to monitor and be proactive in treating heart failure? So we have about 150 patients that we follow with this type of technology who are also part of our remote monitoring program. We found this to be another great way to help anticipate and reduce heart failure events and also helps us be smarter with our medication adjustments. So just as a give an example of one of our hub and spoke kind of models as we kind of wrap up these slides. So Hayes is a place we go to that's, you probably heard of Hayes, Fort Hayes or Hayes, Kansas. It's about four hours away from Kansas City. We get on a little plane. Uh, we take out two physicians and a nurse practitioner. When we go out there, we'll go out in one day, we'll see about 50 patients as a group. Um, it's a lot of patients, it's really aggressive, but we do that because these patients come from all over the place across Western Kansas. At that visit, we try to outline a blueprint for how we want to care for that patient, but to continue to stay involved with those patients, we do remote monitoring technologies to actually help us adjust medications and, and, and conference in with the patient who may still be six, seven, eight hours away, even though we're coming to Hayes once a month. So it's been a great way for us to improve our access for patients. And the last slide here is, I just wanna give a shout out to my team. And this is a slide uh, that has a photo of us um, celebrating um, a couple of years ago, some of our milestones. And I often say, you know, program building is team building and it's supporting people. And the most important resource we have in any team is our people. And technology is great, but you have to have great people and you gotta take care of your people. So I always say a team that celebrates together their wins uh, is gonna also be able to do a, a much better job overcoming the challenges and the, and the conflicts. And so I, I like to say we have the best team um, and hopefully any program leader believes that about his or her team. And I'm super proud of these folks and they care a lot about our patients. And as of today, we see almost 15,000 patient encounters uh, a year in our many clinic locations with nearly 2000 patients that come through our hospital and um, over 60 patients who get the durable LVAD and nearly 40 patients who, are, who undergo transplantation and many more who go through um, remote monitoring technologies that help us improve our, our access for patients to receive the best therapies. So in summary, define your mission, know your why, and we've talked about ours to provide the best possible access to, to therapies for patients with heart failure outline what those best therapies are, clean up your own house before you try to clean up others, standardize your process, get a map so you have a strategy for how you're going to provide the access in a systematic way, make sure you figure out a way to pay for the technology, uh, make sure you fill out a way to pilot the technology so you don't get in too deep and find out that you're hemorrhaging resources that um, maybe could be best used other places, and then always reflect, revise, and repeat. And with that, I think we have some time for questions and hopefully this has provided a 
landscape for you all to understand what we have going on in hard flow remote monitoring. Thank you so very much. That was great. Um, I have four questions up already, and I am going to give everyone an opportunity to type your question into the Q&A box, uh, and then we will read them from there. But um, the first question I have is, is, it, is the um, CardioMEMS device placed via catheter? Is that how it's placed? Yeah, and I didn't want to get too far into the weeds with that, but basically it's a standard right heart catheterization. So basically we go in through the femoral vein or the jugular vein. Generally the femoral vein is the FDA indicated pathway. And so it is a same day procedure. And you know, cardiac catheterization procedures are the types of procedures as many patients understand. Uh, hospitals routinely do these types of procedures thousands of times a year. It is a generally very safe procedure we have never had a patient die of a complication or be disabled by a complication or have had a major life-threatening event. Um, the main complication risk is uh, bleeding at the time of the implant at the site of access, but generally we have not had any problem managing that particular challenge. Great, thank you. Um, so the data that you're getting, uh, is it monitored even if the patient isn't paying attention? So, or that, does the patient need to be the one paying attention to the monitoring, the data? It depends on the technology. For cardiomems, the patient needs to lay on that pillow every day for about 20 seconds, give or take. And that allows the information from the chip to go to the pillow and then go to the cloud. And then that data point is what we get as a trend when we're following that uh, on our system on the other side. Um, on the other hand, if you have heart logic technology, which is implantable, if the alerts are turned on, then no matter what you're doing, we're going to be getting data back from that patient. Uh, and then we engage with the patient if there's an alert and try to figure out what to make sense of as it relates to that data. Uh, so it depends on the technology, but some, some technologies have continuous access and some do not. Great. Okay, um, the next question is, what do you think of, in, of home testing of INR? I think home testing of INR has an enormous advantage for the right kind of patients. There are some concerns about data integrity as it relates to how the INR is going to uh, reliably be consistent with the, the, the main campus lab. So INR, may, if you do a point of care home INR, and say it's 2.7, that may in actuality be the same as 2.1 if you do it in the main campus lab. So one of the concerns is, will the home INR be reliable? Um, I think what you have to figure out is just how to get internal consistency. So if you find out what range a patient needs to be for a therapeutic level, and they're getting the same home INR uh, technology, generally you can find ways to make that safe. So I think it's great. I think you just have to be careful that, you know, if you need a very tightly controlled INR, there may be some risks to home INR. It's not for everybody. Great. Um, so here's a, a question that I had actually. Um, why is the disparities in giving medications so wide? I mean, why are not enough people getting their medications? Can you speak on that? Yeah, it's a complex problem. Uh, and I would say that there's sort of a couple different bins. So there are system barriers, there are provider prescribing barriers, and then there's cost barriers. So in the cost barriers issue, I mean, if you were to go in and say, I want to talk to my doctor about Entresto, there's a decent chance that the copay that you'd be asked to pay for that drug, even though it's the best drug we have, uh, that copay may be cost prohibitive for some and many patients. So when you look at you know, the data, they may fall in that 99% of patients who are not getting access to the best therapies. Now, uh, another example is we have a lot of patients that are so far remote from a specialty clinic that maybe the only access they get to care is through a primary care practice that is nervous about implementing novel therapies like Entresto, which are more potent and sometimes um, some, there's some challenges in prescribing that medication class. And so therefore, because they, 
they don't have a clinic near them that's willing to prescribe that medicine and feel comfortable with it and monitor them on that medicine, then guess what? That patient's not going to get that medicine. So that's one of the challenges we face with rural disparities. Um, I also think there's some inertia amongst the physicians. I think that there's always um, physicians that want to hold out and they don't want to get on board with the newest therapies. And there's some, sometimes good reasons for that. For example, we've had medications that have been pulled off the market. Everyone remembers Vioxx, you know, when that was pulled. Of course, Vioxx is a painkiller and it was killing people. So it's a whole different uh, argument to make. This is a life-saving medication that it's for a terrible disease like heart failure. And so I personally think waiting another five years to see and confirm that Entresto is a good drug, I think that's kind of irresponsible. So I think many of us are frustrated to see that there's still physicians, um, be it even cardiologists, who refuse to be innovative in, and progressive in what medications they prescribe. Um, lately, I've taken to social media to sort of shame people, to be honest, and just say, look, if you are a patient with a reduced ejection fraction and you're still on lisinopril, when you could be on Entresto, you're getting inferior care. And so we have to just get the public to understand and get physicians and nurse practitioners in this space to understand that there's a, there are right ways to do this. And the guidelines are the best way to, to, to sort of stay up with things. When the American Heart Association guidelines written by people who are the experts who did the trials, who know the data best, are saying, you know, this is the best therapy and it should be first line for any patient that is a candidate, we need to do that. Uh, and so unfortunately, there's still a lot of reasons why patients aren't getting the best therapies. Great, thank you. So would an Apple Watch monitor blood pressure? Um, the, I guess there is um, the blood pressure machine at home shows an average of 105 over 64, but can drop to 88 over 58 or go to 120 over 69. Um, and she says she only takes the reading first thing in the morning or when she's not feeling well. So um, does an Apple Watch have that capability? As far as I know by itself, uh, it cannot do that yet. Um, but there may be ways to provide information on the Apple Watch that could create sort of what we call a surrogate marker of blood pressure. And, and again, a lot of people are buzzing about machine learning or, or artificial intelligence or AI. And so we, there are a lot of us that believe that there are signals that machines and, and intelligence from AI could be able to see that could correlate with markers like blood pressure that allows us to basically indirectly assess blood pressure or other markers of heart failure. So I would say stay tuned. I think the Apple Watch has a lot of good uh, data. Most of it is heart rate and heart rhythm related. And be careful because the Apple Watch may also pick on pick up on nonsensical data that could just create a lot of undue anxiety and stress. And so we're still a little nervous about the rolling out of the Apple Watch to the public, uh, especially those that have diseases like heart failure, because we're not quite sure what's gonna happen with all this data when it gets brought in and what to do with it, because we know that certain things may be abnormal for any normal patient uh, on the Apple Watch, but they may not be abnormal for a heart failure patient. So it becomes difficult to know sometimes what to do with these data. Great. So another question here is how well are other states doing with this technology and the remote monitoring at home? Yeah, um, I would say there's still a wide variation in the application of technologies. We are on the progressive end of the spectrum. There's not many programs in the country that can say the things that we've just said about what we're doing. I'd say there's less than 10 programs in the, in the country right now that have the full spectrum of remote monitoring technologies staffed to the level that we have as of today. But COVID and telemedicine uh, as a, as a um, resurgence, as a, as a revitalization has now gained a lot of momentum because they, we've realized that it's unsafe to bring all these patients into clinic in the setting of a pandemic. That has accelerated a lot of systems, multiple states, multiple cities to, to really kind of come along with this technology. So I would say you kind of have to ask uh, your, your, the folks at your programs, you know, what do we have in remote monitoring? And if you get like a lot of blinking and blank stares, I think you know the answer to the question. Uh, and then there's a lot of programs that are dabbling in this, but they're not really all in and they're not staffed appropriately. So one of the things we're trying to do is help other programs learn how to do a workflow and a staffing model that is uh, best suited to support the program economically. We feel like we've got a really good best practice. And so we always open up 
the invitation to allow programs to learn from what we've done on a pragmatic level. And that's why I said, um, you know, over the last couple of months, it's like every week I'm giving a talk for another big system, sharing our story on how we do remote monitoring. Last week it was Mass General. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to be presenting to Mount Sinai in, in New York City, and I've got West Virginia in, uh, in, uh, in January. So I think a lot of programs are now looking for ways to find success that other programs have had and duplicate that. And I think that's great. And that's going to be really good for all patients. Great. So a person with stents, are they able to have the CardioMEMS device and is it needed? So those are two separate questions and an important distinction. So can they have a CardioMEMS device? Yes. You actually need a blood thinner for at least one month after the CardioMEMS goes in, no different than if you were to have a stent. So I probably wouldn't be implanting a CardioMEMS at the same time as a stent. In fact, I know I would not because that's not an appropriate time to do it. Uh, but the, but when you have a stent, you tend to have to be on a, on a blood thinner like Plavix or Prastagrel or uh, Ticagrel or these other medicines. And if you're on those medicines, you can still get a CardioMEMS device. In fact, we use that medicine that you get for your stent to help cover the, uh, the you know, allow for the, the CardioMEMS device to, to, to also become acclimated to the blood vessel that we put that, uh, the chip in. As far as um, the other question, um, I think that the decision for CardioMEMS is really about the risk of a patient uh, to be hospitalized for heart failure at this point in time. I think we're going to use it for more and more patients as we see more data. But right now, we focus on patients who are having a hard time staying out of the hospital who have a lot of symptoms with exertion. That's what we meant by the hospitalization requirement. And so for now, that still is the is the niche space that this is in. But it's going to grow as we start to learn how to expand it to less sick patients. So is the cardio MEMS device applicable to HEF REF patients or just HEF PET? It's applicable and beneficial to both. But for HEF PEF, there's no really great endorsed single therapy. And so I look at this as the proportional benefit for HEF PEF is actually greater because we don't have all these other really great medicines. We now have four FDA approved medicines for HEF REF, reduced ejection fraction, and probably soon to be five. Um, and then we've got some that are sort of additional supplemental medicines. So there's like six medicines that you can use for reduced ejection fraction heart failure. And for HEF PEF, it really comes down to controlling volume, controlling pressure, controlling rhythm, uh, controlling comorbidity disease management. And those are actually much easier to do with remote monitoring technology. And so that's why I would say it's beneficial for both but the ability to really make a difference for a patient population seems to be proportionally larger in the HEF-PEF group. Great. Um, I have two last questions. If anybody else has any questions, please feel free to type them in as we're talking. Um, the one question is, how would you react to a national program for this type of model? Meaning like if there was an opportunity to talk about doing, duplicating what we're doing at a national level, of course, we would be uh, happy to come to that table and, and talk about ways to do that. Um, I, I've had similar questions brought to me by um, the American Heart Association. I've had that question posed by the American College of Cardiology. Um, I've even volunteered our program to be part of a, for example, a rural Healthcare Disparities Committee with the American Heart Association, we would absolutely step up and uh, be a voice and a champion for doing this kind of activity across the country. Uh, the, other, the other model that sometimes people propose is what if you had a few mothership hubs across the country, programs like ours that could get much bigger, and then we could actually follow patients that aren't even in our region, but we could sort of help adjust, uh, guide patients' therapies using ours as like a hub. Uh, I have to explore those models too. There's some challenges with licensure and uh, there's some legal, uh, you know, medical malpractice uh, implications we'd have to sort out. But more importantly, what we would like love to do is duplicate what we found to be very uh, effective on a pragmatic level in a program building way. We would love to find ways to advance uh, our lessons learned so that other programs can, can do something the same or to allow a best practices uh, forum to exist for the national conversation. Great. Okay. 
Well, now we have two more questions. And <laughs> so um, telehealth, insurance, do you, do you foresee insurance problems down the road after COVID is over um, with being able to have the insurance companies still pay for telehealth? Um, I don't think anybody knows for sure. I predict that the insurance companies will follow suit with Centers for Medicare and Medicaid uh, and what the federal government does, uh, the insurance companies will follow suit. I think they'll be, uh, they, they'll almost be forced to uh, because uh, there's a lot of compelling reasons why telehealth should be legitimized. And the posture that we see from CMS today is that telehealth is not going away. And many of us are applauding that. I will also tell you again, having served on the ACC roundtable a couple of weeks ago, the American College of Cardiology is a, um, is a lobbying organization along with the American Heart Association that has made it very clear that they will push to ensure that Congress enacts um, some permanent, uh, uh, some permanent um, commitments to CMS to maintain telehealth as a, a legitimate and viable way for patients to receive care because again, I believe it reduces disparities and improves uh, safe access for patients. And it actually saves a lot of dollars by not having to put up a building on every corner to see patients um, or require patients to drive or find a bus or a train. Um, so I think that it's probably here to stay. Um, and actually the reimbursement is very appropriate. It's the same. So the same visit I do in clinic over 25 minutes can be reimbursed to the health system and the physician the same as a telemedicine visit. And that's what needed to happen because you don't want the incentives to, in this pay for performance culture that we have in America, you don't want the incentives to favor building buildings and forcing patients in their cars when you can do just as good a care in about 50% of the encounters by using telemedicine. Great, thank you. So the last question we have <clears throat> may be too much of an individualized personal question. So I will just let you know in advance. And if you can maybe give a high level overview of what the numbers mean, that might be appropriate. Um, the, the patient says, I had an echo and see three EF entries, one 33%, one 50%, an LV Simpson biplane EF at 44%. What does that mean? Yeah, it's a common question. It's an important one. In other words, why are the ejection fractions so different from the same study from the same patient? And which one is right? So the Simpsons is a computer model and it has value, but we also know that the eyeball, the trained eye of the cardiologist reading an echo is as good or better than the Simpsons. Um, we also know that if you ask 10 cardiologists to put an ejection fraction number down, on the same echo that it will range by as much as 10% in either direction. So please do not be alarmed by the fact that you can see an ejection fraction range from 35 to 55% for your echo. Um, the point is it's somewhere in between that range. Um, and oftentimes we're able to make all the right decisions based on that range. But it's very disconcerting for patients when they say, well, I, you just looked at the echo and you just said it was 35% and then the final read comes out and it's 30%. Now I'll get that call and I'll say, they'll say, doc, you said it was 35%. Why is it 30? I'm like, well, it's the same. It's just within the margin of you know, sort of acceptable difference of interpretation. Um, and so I guess the answer to the question is, you know, we're not as good at giving that number as we would like to all say we are. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but Generally, as long as we've got an estimated range within about 10%, our ability to decide what therapies patients should receive is consistent. Great, thank you. And thank you so much for a great hour spent. Um, we are at the top of the hour. And right before we leave though, I want to let everybody know, next Thursday, same time at three o'clock Eastern, we will be finishing our series with an amazing panel, and I tell you they're amazing because we, we already know, um, panel of patients who will be talking with Dr. Philip Adamson. Um, he will be moderating the panel, and they will be answering the questions as experts, and I promise you, you won't want to miss. So mark your calendars, make sure you're registered um, to finish out this series, and as always, we want to gratefully acknowledge um, the educational grant from Abbott that has made this series possible. Dr. Sowers, thank you so much for spending the hour and sharing what you all are doing 
Um, it's amazing, and we really appreciate your commitment to patients. Thank you for the opportunity. And like I said, I, I always enjoy talking to patients and their families. And so this is a real privilege for us. Thank you. And everyone have a great day. Thank you.